Hi everybody and welcome to lesson 1.3, Ecosystem Services and Environmental Theories and Worldviews. The content in this video is aligned to the third edition of Environmental Science for AP and covers information from College Board Lesson 2.2, 5.1, and 5.12. Environmental science is a discipline that impacts real-world decisions in a multitude of ways. Each scientist, politician, economist, and individual will react to environmental questions and issues differently based on their worldview. It is important to understand these things that color how we address our concerns. This leads us to the content objective of understanding that ecosystems have structure and diversity that change over time. Humans can mitigate their impact on land and water resources. And when humans use natural resources, they alter natural systems. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe ecosystem services, describe the results of human interruptions to ecosystem services, identify the major environmental worldviews, compare and contrast biocentric and anthropocentric worldviews, explain the concept of the tragedy of the commons, and explain the concept of sustainability which leads us to being able to answer the guiding question of how do we make decisions about environmental issues? In order to address the concepts and issues that come to us related to environmental science, we have to understand the way in which an individual or groups of individuals approach these problems. In general, we can identify these worldviews as part of one of two major categories, biocentric or anthropocentric. Biocentric worldviews are those that see the environment around us as being worth existence on its own, meaning it has an independent existence value, and expect that we should behave as part of the environment rather than exhibiting dominion over it. One of the first major biocentric worldviews is the idea of land ethic, first put forth by Aldo Leopold in the 1940s. This worldview argues that human beings are just a part of the larger ecosystem. Leopold put it simply that land ethic should be the golden rule of engaging with the world around us. Do nothing to the environment that you wouldn't do to yourself. Anthropocentric, with anthropos being the Greek prefix for man, worldviews are those that place humans in a position of management or dominion of the environment. While it does not remove us entirely from the environment around us, it does give us permission to behave as if we are its masters. We can be more specific about our ideas of environmental worldviews. Within the biocentric worldview, we can approach environmental problems from an environmental wisdom perspective. This works very closely with the idea of land ethic, where we understand that we are part of the larger environment. With earth wisdom, or environmental wisdom, we also understand that it is vital that we learn the rhythms of nature and work and move within them to be successful as a species. This worldview is commonly associated with indigenous populations. With the destruction wrought by the Industrial Revolution, many people are revisiting this idea as a potential solution to reversing the damage done. In the anthropocentric arena, we have the large idea of planetary management. This argues that because we can manage the world around us, we should. This worldview argues that we are able to, success, to be successful and meet all of our needs through our intelligence and development of additional supportive technology. Within the planetary management worldview, there are two specific schools of thought that provide a more specific understanding of this idea. The Earth as a Spaceship School and the No Problem School. The Earth as a Spaceship School argues that because the Earth is a set of interconnected systems, like a spaceship, if we can understand how the systems work and interconnect, then we can manipulate the systems to our advantage. The No Problem School approaches environmental problems from the perspective that our ability to develop new technology will solve the problems that arise in our world. Developing these technologies will allow us to ensure that we do not run out of resources even as our population grows exponentially. Lastly, there's the stewardship worldview, 
which seeks to bridge the gap between planetary management and environmental or earth wisdom. The stewardship worldview argues that because we can manage the environment around us, we should do so, but do it ethically with the goal of maintaining the health of the ecosystem, an appropriately abundant resource supply, and the survival of our population. These understandings of our place in the environment greatly inform the way in which we approach questions of resource use. From this came two ideas, conservation and preservation. Each of these ideas are driven by a particular philosophy and goal. Preservation is the idea that natural resources have a right to exist on their own, undamaged and untouched by human society. In this way, the focus of our interaction with the natural world should be minimal at best and aggressively protective at worst. This idea was first articulated by John Muir, a writer and naturalist in the early 20th century. He believed that humans should enjoy natural resources from afar. In the simplest terms, Muir argued, look, but don't touch. Conservation is the idea that we should use our natural resources, but we should use them in a responsible way that allows for the resources to replenish for future generations. This is the idea of responsible use that was first proposed by Gifford Pinchot, the founder of the US Forest Service advisor to President Theodore Roosevelt, and a former student of Muir's. These competing ideas came to fruition as Pinchot and Muir fought on opposite sides of a question of whether or not to dam the Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite National Park. In the end, Pinchot and his ideas of conservation won out in the environmental policies of the early 20th century. The latter 20th century is a completely different story. With the idea of resource use, we must discuss the idea of management. To understand this, let's go back to pastoral Europe. Every town or village had what was called a commons, or an area that was shared by everyone, but belonging to no one. This commons was used for multiple purposes, including town meetings, celebrations, and in some cases, the grazing of ruminant animals like cows and sheep. In order to maintain the quality of the commons and the ability to use it in the future, farmers had to be careful about how many animals they put on the commons at any given time and how long they gave the area to recover between grazings. Because there's no owner or defined manager of the resource, the farmers are able to use as much of the common as they like for as long as they please. When one or more farmers choose to put more animals on the common than it can support, making it impossible for the entire community to take part in its usage, then the tragedy of the commons has occurred. Individuals make use of shared resources without concern for the impact on others, thus leading to a collective loss in overall resource. There are two ways of simply describing the tragedy of the commons. Individual short-term gains lead to long-term collective losses, or humans are selfish and will take more than their fair share. This idea was put forth by Garrett Hardin in the 1960s. While there is some evidence that the tragedy of the commons occurs around the world, it is much more common in communities of Western European descent and Western capitalist ideas. Once we have an understanding of our place in the world and how we view the environment around us, we can begin to look at the ways in which we benefit from our interactions with the natural world. Unfortunately, human society often places value on things only in monetary terms. For this reason, we explored the idea of ecosystem services, which are ways that we place a monetary value on the things the natural world provides for us. We will often look at these values in terms of raw materials provided or money saved in order to make decisions about resource use or protection. We define ecosystem services in one of four categories, provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting. Let's take a look at each of these services in a little more detail. We'll begin with supporting services, as these are the actions needed by the ecosystem to function. Without supporting services, there are no others. 
The best examples of supporting services are the biogeochemical cycles. These processes, also known as nutrient cycles, provide a key resource for supporting the ecosystem as a whole. Examples of biogeochemical cycles include nitrogen and carbon cycling. Provisioning services are those that allow us to obtain some physical product. This can be timber for construction or food from hunting. In some cases, there is a direct monetary benefit from these services. In others, it is simply the saving of money that is the benefit. Regulating services are those that maintain the health and quality of an ecosystem. The best example of this is water filtration through wetlands. Plant roots naturally slow down the movement of water through soil. As this occurs, impurities such as ions, pollutants, and other compounds can be filtered from the water by plant roots or other organisms. This can reduce the amount of pollutants that enter waterways, thus reducing the need for extensive water treatment. Lastly, there are cultural services which provide us with recreational or other non-tangible benefits. This can include historical sites or spiritual experiences. It is important to note that humans have a large impact on these services in the way that they are utilized and protected. When services are abused, such as the removal of trees for timber, then other services will be affected, such as a loss of primary productivity in supporting services. Remember that the earth is a series of interconnected systems. If one part of the system fails, there are clear cascading issues that will occur in other areas. The following slide provides you with an opportunity to see how some of these ideas are connected together. Feel free to pause the video and explore the connections between these topics. Then use the statements at the beginning to review.